the Rockets drove the ball. They were, they were just really aggressive. Had us on our heels all night long. Anybody else? You guys just getting paid to... Some classic pop last night during his very short post-game presser in Big Board Sports. And boys, high school basketball, the Lytle Pirates are getting ready to play the Childress Bobcats in the UIL Class 3A state semifinals Thursday at 3 p.m. at the Alamo Dome. This marks the Pirates' first trip to state in 99 years. The Pirates are 34 and 6 this season and beat London 67 47 in the regional final, advancing to state. This afternoon, we made the trip to Lytle to talk with the Pirates ahead of their biggest game of the season. It's been extremely special, you know, me and the guys, we've been working since the summer, just putting in the work, and it feels good to not only be able to attend the state tournament, but we got to put on for our community, and it means a lot to us. A group of guys that just like to work. Uh, last year we fell short first round. Uh, this year we woke up early, grinded every day, and just practiced really hard. A blessing, really. Like, four teams out of the whole state, and we're one of them, so just ready to keep going. My phone has been blowing up nonstop. Our mayor, our whole town is excited. Um, you know, we're a smaller community, even though we're outside of San Antonio, you know, it's still a very big, small town feel. So they are ecstatic and, you know, it's exciting. Exciting, it's been almost 100 years. So we're excited to be that group to uh, take us back to the state tournament. All right, so the last time Lytle advanced the state was in 1924. And there's an interesting story how Coach found out about that squad. We'll have that for you tonight on the Night Beat. It's an exciting time for the UTSA women's basketball team as they prepare for the Conference USA Championships this week. Earning the number six seed, the Roadrunners will face number 11 Florida Atlantic in the first round. The Roadrunners enter this game as winners of four in a row and six of their last eight, while the Owls have lost eight straight. But all of that means nothing now because anything can happen in March Madness. Good teams peak at the right times. And um, this whole season, we are like, when are we going to peak? Like, when are we going to peak? When are we going to, you know? get things going and get wins in order and um, you know I think we finally did and we beat some pretty good teams in our conference and I think we're confident and um, our confidence grows with every win. You can't count us out you know I guess there was initial thoughts of what UTSA was especially because it's a rebuilding program but I think that with me, Jordy, other local products, Kira from USC coming here I think it's just the potential is endless for us. UTSA and Florida Atlantic will play Wednesday at 2 p.m. on Court B at the Star in Frisco. The Spurs dropped the home and home series to the Houston Rockets, losing Saturday night at the AT&T Center, 122 to 110, and then last night at the Toyota Center, 142 to 110. And once again, the third quarter led to the Spurs' demise as Houston outscored them last night, 34-24, to lead by 21 after three, and the Rockets just cruised from there. I thought Houston was really good, physical, strong team. Uh, you know, size got them going good. They're energetic. They're aggressive. Uh, doing a hell of a job. So uh, they they deserve to to win the game. The Spurs will next play on Friday night when they host the Utah Jazz at seven at the AT&T Center. By the way, can we go back to Lytle for a second? Yes, let's go. I back. love their I love their logo. Yes, gold blooded. Gold blooded. <laughs> yeah, they come up with some awesome. pretty nifty ideas down there with sayings. Yeah, I like it. Thanks, Thanks Larry. Larry. Well, snow it can be dangerous all by itself, but when it gets in the way of rescues, that's even worse. What parts of California have been dealing with, and when all this snow will let up? And the railway company responsible for two train derailments in one state, making quick safety changes. But will it be enough? Will it work? We're going to break down what they are and how federal officials are holding this company accountable. And today, railway company Norfolk Southern announced a six point plan to improve safety, which includes providing real time warnings to crews, boosting train braking capabilities. This announcement comes after a second major derailment in just more than a month. One of their cargo trains derailed in Springfield, Ohio on Saturday. This is what you're looking at. It sent 28 cars careening off the tracks. Officials quickly stressed the train was not carrying toxic material and no one was injured, making clear this derailment different from the one in East Palestine. That derailment resulted in an explosion and evacuation and a toxic cleanup that is still underway. A Senate hearing is scheduled on Thursday about that crash. 
Another round of record-breaking snow in the west, up to five more inches for California's Sierra Nevada mountains. Over 48 feet of snow has already fallen this season. That snow blanketing roofs, swallowing up homes, and if you look closely, creating some rolling avalanches. Crews clearing roads, removing more than 2,000 Olympic-sized swimming pools worth of snow from San Bernardino County alone. Placer County under a state of emergency with no power, no water, no internet service. Officials warn that it could take days to reach others who are stuck in the snow. We have snow plows, but it's just too thick and it's too hard and they're just not equipped for this kind of ice. It's just too much. Mountain communities in Southern California do have a break in the forecast with no snow, but they're still dealing with windy conditions. All right, we got through mountain cedar season, but as is always the case in South Texas, there's a new pollen to pester our sinuses. Oak, Ursula Perry, shows us a new device designed to help patients breathe more freely so we can smell spring flowers, just not sneeze at them. Cato Coleman is a registered dietitian who works in food service, but a few years ago, his allergies started to get in the way. So I'm sitting there at the table eating, and I was having trouble breathing through my nose and chewing at the same time. Coleman was diagnosed with chronic sinusitis and nasal polyps, which were wrecking his sense of taste and smell. So someone who loves to cook, someone who loves food, someone who works in the food business, not being able to smell food really took away from that. Ear, nose and throat surgeon Adam Spees removed the polyps and then last year recommended that Coleman try a new device designed to treat people with chronic sinus problems that result in those polyps, the system called Exhance. It is different because it delivers, delivers the medications higher up in the nose. Exhance is inserted in a person's nose and mouth. As the user exhales, a common medication called fluticasone is delivered deep into the sinuses where over-the-counter nasal sprays can't reach. Dr. Spees says the device has reduced his patient's symptoms. I've had a lot of patients that have not had to have surgery, which typically we would have to have surgery in the past. Cato has been using Exhance daily for almost a year. Love the smell of red pepper. He has regained his sense of smell, and as a bonus, he's sleeping better than he has in years. Full night, yeah, it's awesome, yeah. Lots of energy, too. The Exhance system has been FDA approved, but you're going to need a prescription, and it's only prescribed for those who have chronic sinusitis as well as those nasal polyps. However, that said, there are clinical trials underway right now to find out if this system works on those who simply have the chronic sinusitis. Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. <laughs> Southwest Airlines calling the situation unusual and unsettling after a bird strike caused smoke to fill a plane's cabin and then oxygen masks to drop midair. This flight was headed to Fort Lauderdale from Havana, Cuba on Sunday when Southwest says a bird hit the engine and the plane's nose shortly after takeoff. <laughs> You can tell it was pretty chaotic. The plane turned around, made an emergency landing. Passengers had to cover their faces as they evacuated. Since January last year, there have been 1,700 wildlife plane strikes, according to the Federal Aviation Administration. A scary moment at Boston's Logan International Airport when two planes clipped wings on the tarmac this morning. Now the Federal Aviation Administration investigating this incident. It happened near the gates where passengers boarded the two United flights, one plane bound for Newark, New Jersey, the other for Denver. Airport officials say the collision happened as the flight departing for Newark pushed back from the gate. Nobody injured, but both flights were canceled. Passengers had to be rebooked on different flights. Newly convicted murderer Alex Murdaugh woke up, woke up today in a jail cell as an inmate in a South Carolina prison processing center. Murdaugh has been sentenced to two consecutive life sentences for the murders of his wife and his son. He learned his punishment on Friday and maintains his innocence. Murdaugh will undergo an approximately 45-day medical, mental health, and education assessment before being transferred to a maximum security prison in South Carolina. It is a day the entire state of Texas will not forget. The Battle of the Alamo. Why the descendants of those who fought continue to keep the significance of this days-long battle and a historical event alive.
Hundreds of people gathering today in front of the Alamo before sunrise to honor those who fought and died in the final battle of the Alamo. Today marks 187 years since that famous battle. Our Sarah Acosta spoke with descendants about why they choose to remember. Loading the muskets, taking aim, and firing. That's how the dawn of the Alamo event concluded as the sun rose over the famous landmark this morning. Today marks 187 years since those who fought and gave their lives for Texas independence. This event honors and remember those who made those sacrifices at the Alamo. Gary Foreman says he helped establish the event 37 years ago along with the San Antonio Living History Association. He says it's important that we learn to embrace our history. Other historic districts around the country and the world would give anything to have this kind of history in their own backyard. His wife Lori is a direct descendant of Davy Crockett. She says she has heard so many stories passed down over the years about her important relative. My uh, grandparents did and my father before me. I have to continue to honor him. Families not just from San Antonio but across Texas were at the Alamo today like Charlie Stevenson and his sons who says he wants to teach them about their heritage. It's a very very uh, special in my heart to have my boys here and experience this heritage and to honor those those that fell here 187 years ago. So it's just really a special honor to be a part of it. When they, uh... Rick Reyes started the ceremony with a traditional Native American prayer. He says it's important for healing to take place on these Alamo grounds. And that's what we're here to recognize that we have all have pain. We're all made blood. We're all made from the same dirt. So we recognize that we have ceremonies here, and now I'm bringing that information to them. That's why it's important for me to be here. The Alamo also opened the Alamo Collection Center last week, which of course features the Phil Collins Collection in a 10,000 square foot gallery, which is now open to the public. From the Alamo, I'm Sarah Costa, KSAT 12 News. Look outside with live cam. Around sunrise, it was misty, kind of murky out there. Is that sort of what we're expecting as we seem to be in a pretty spring-like pattern, Adam? Yeah, misty, it feels murky mornings. Murky mornings. Murky, but I can't even say it. Misty, murky mornings, misty, murky mornings, misty, murky mornings. Of misty. course, carry on. <laughs> I'm trying. I just have to really focus on it. Uh, anyway, this evening, it's going to be humid. 80 degrees right now. By 9 o'clock, we're at 72. Midnight at 67. It'll just gradually fall down into the mid-60s, and that's where we're going to settle for early tomorrow morning. We'll talk about how long these murky, misty mornings are going to last in just a bit. Murky, misty mornings. All right, here's a question. How much is one poncho worth to you? For Texas rapper Bun B, $1,000. That's what he's offering for a poncho that he lost during a performance at the rodeo in Houston. The rapper posted about the reward money along with a picture of him in the poncho to his fans on Instagram. In the post, he wrote, I don't care who has it, just get it back to me and take the money, no questions asked. Yeah, the poncho was from the purple brand and shows the emblem of the popular rap group UGK. That was created by Bun B and late rapper legend Pimp C. It's a winter sport like no other. The Colorado mountain town of Leadville hosted its annual ski joring and crystal carnival this weekend. It's a unique spectacle to see. You see joring involves someone riding a horse down a snowy street at high speed. Behind them <laughs> attached is a rope and a skier. The skier has to grab rings along the way and navigate eight foot jumps. What? Some skiers reach speeds of 40 miles an hour as they were pulled by these horses. Yeah, that's horsepower right there. Uh, yeah, and then some. I want to know how that was created. I want to know Probably what would be joring become an Olympic sport. It should be. That's what I want to know. Yeah, I bet it was one of those things that was like a dare or a bet, but you can't do it, you know? Yeah. It's, it feels like maybe that. a few adult beverages were had before they thought yeah. of that one. I'm just saying, maybe. Yeah, absolutely. You know, actually, the way the hurricane hunters and that whole um, basically measurement process was essentially a dare by two uh, army pilots out of Texas when a tropical storm was off the coast of Texas in the Gulf of Mexico. And it was, well, you can't do it. Yeah, I can't do it. Then they did it. They came back. Then a meteorologist hopped on board with them and they did it again. And then there was the birth of the hurricane hunters, essentially. That's the very condensed version. But oh, wow. yeah. 
That's why I always say that's the way a lot of things start. It's a, it's a bet, right? Yeah. <laughs> Guys doing dude stuff, being macho and trying to uh, outdo the other. Anyway, noticeable humidity next few days, morning rounds of fog and drizzle, then a cold front hits on Friday. And with that, we will have a chance of storms. Don't get too excited. We're talking a 30% chance of storms as we get into Friday. That could change a little bit, but I don't, don't have a lot of confidence in those rain chances rising much. Okay. Let's take a look at our overall pattern. Quiet across Texas. You go up to the Pacific Northwest. That's the next system moving in and coming in off the Pacific, and that's going to be throwing more moisture into California. You saw those national stories about the mountains in California, even down in Southern California near Big Bear. I mean, we're talking not far from the desert, right? But they're up at elevation and they're going to see more feet of snow stranding people in their houses there. So they've got more to come, but remember they also rely on that water in the warm season, the melt water from that snowfall. So if they don't don't get a lot of snow in the winter, it can be very detrimental to the entire state and that region come spring and especially summer. Now, this is a little too much of a good thing for now. Anyway, that's them. We've got this cold front off to the north. It's dropping into North Texas this is going to be the player Throughout the state in the coming days, it's going to be the focal point of some showers and even thunderstorms throughout the week up until about Friday. And that's when our next cold front comes in and actually decides to push that boundary southward and give us a chance of those showers and thunderstorms. I wish that boundary was draped right over San Antonio this week because then we would have off and on rain chances. But instead, it's our friends to the north. Not that they really need it. A good chunk of North Texas here around Dallas, not even considered abnormally dry. East Texas, not even considered abnormally dry. The worst of the drought right here around San Antonio, where you see these darker reds. That's the extreme and exceptional drought. We're still trying to dent, put a dent in that and chip away at it. And there isn't a significant opportunity at rain within sight. 82, that was our high today. It's good 11 degrees above average. Right now we're at 80. Dew point is 61. You notice that humidity and the dew points are in the low to mid 60s and they're going to rise through the evening and into the night and that's going to mean another round of fog. Here's our visibility future cast and expect the reduced visibility and the dampness for tomorrow morning. After midnight, the fog is going to start developing and it's going to vary location to location throughout the morning, but we could have some visibilities below a mile for brief periods of time through the morning commute. And then by 10 AM, the clouds lift still fairly gray and then we break out into sunshine by the afternoon. So 64 degrees at 7 AM by noon. We're at 72, still cloudy, but then the sun comes out a little bit. We'll make it up to 83 later on in the day. 86, Castroville, 83, Comfort tomorrow. New Braunfels and Seguin up to 84. And then the cold front hits, and we should drop back down into the lower 70s for afternoon highs by Friday. And this weekend, a mixture of some 70s and 80s, leaving you with a uh, sign of spring. Look at those blue bonnets there on the yeah. southwest side. Very nice. That is mm -hmm. such a cool picture. That's beautiful. It's Thanks, good, Adam. Good looking horse, too. Mm -hmm. All right, so the music world today taking some time to remember Gary Rossington, one of the original members of Leonard Skinner after the announcement of his passing, how the founding guitarist was key to the band's success. This morning, the music world waking up in mourning to learn rock and roll legend Leonard Skinner, founding guitarist Gary Rossington has passed away. Rossington was the last surviving original member of the Southern Rock Band. ABC's Laura Spencer shares the musical memories he leaves behind. The music world celebrating the life of Leonard Skinner guitarist and co-founder Gary Rossington. The Jacksonville, Florida native founded the iconic Southern rock band in high school with his friends Ronnie Van Zant and Bob Burns. Rossington helping churn out hit songs for the band, including one of their biggest hits, Sweet Home Alabama.
At the height of their fame, the band shattered. Lead singer Ronnie Van Zant and two other members were killed when the band's plane crashed in 1977. Rossington survived and would later lead a revival of the Southern Supergroup. Overnight, the band sharing on Facebook, Gary is now with his Skinner brothers and family in heaven and playing it pretty like he always does. Morning fog and drizzle. That's going to be the trend every day through Thursday. And then we'll have a little bit of sunshine. Temperatures above average, kind of spring-like. Mid-60s in the morning, low to mid-80s by the afternoon. Then we cool off a little bit Friday with just a 30% chance of storms. And there's your reminder to spring forward an hour. Saturday night into Sunday morning. Yippee. Oof. That's what I say to that. <laughs> Oof. 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 <laughs> Thanks Oof for watching the news at 6. Very well put, by the way. We'll see you on the night beat at 10. Felt appropriate. Yeah. Oof.